Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, it's nice and cool in here, so a little bit of a break from our unusual Berkshire summer weather. I'm Kathy Morris. I'm the senior curator here at the Clark, and I'm delighted to see all of you here. And um, and looking forward to this uh, this lecture related to our exhibition, Splendor, Myth, and Vision, Nudes from the Prado, which I hope you've seen downstairs. Uh, before I um, introduce today's lecturer, I just want to say a, 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 a thing about an exhibition we have opening up at our Lunder Center at Stone Hill. Um, our summer exhibition up there opens on July 4th. It's called Sensing Place, Reflecting on Stone Hill, and is quite an unusual type of exhibition for the Clark because it's not an exhibition, it's not an art exhibition. It's really an exhibition about ideas and about the history and uh, concepts of, the, of place in general and this particular place, Stone Hill, um, where the Clark is located. We've worked with two guest curators who are both professors. Uh, Mark Taylor, who is a professor of religion at Columbia University, but used to be on faculty here in Williams, and Hank Art, who is a biology professor at Williams. And together, the expertise and knowledge of these two incredible men have created something that I think is really extraordinary. So please um, be sure to check that exhibition out once it opens. And the two curators will be giving an opening lecture on July the 10th, which is also a Sunday, up at the Hunter Studio at the Lender Center. So I'm looking forward to that. But today, I am delighted to introduce our lecturer, Jill Burke. Uh, Jill is a senior lecturer in history of art at the University of Edinburgh. She has had fellowships from the Harvard University Center for Italian Renaissance Studies and the Leverholm Trust. Her first book in 2004 was on art patronage and identity in Renaissance Florence. Since then, she has published widely on issues relating to identity and Italian Renaissance art. Her latest book, The Renaissance Nude, Nakedness in Art and Life in Italy, 1400 to 1530, will be published by Yale University Press in 2017. Now, knowing that Jill is one of the leading voices and, and experts on the topic of nudity in early modern art, the Clark reached out to her to contribute an essay to the exhibition catalog for Splendor, Myth, and Vision, Nudes from the Prado. And we were delighted that she agreed to participate. And her, uh, the resulting essay, which is called The European Nude, 1400 to 1650, provides a fascinating and enlightening overview of societal and artistic attitudes and approaches to nudity in this period, setting a larger context for the more specific focus on Spain in uh, our actual exhibition and catalog. And I'm, I'm sure that many of you have already seen the exhibition downstairs, which runs through Columbus Day. What we've found in taking people through the exhibition is that these to the topics that it focuses on, the creation, the collecting, the display of paintings of the nude uh, by the kings of Spain in the 16th and 17th centuries, and then the, the history thereafter, has just be provides springboards for more questions. Uh, the topic is rich and complicated, and it seems that the more you know about this topic, the more you want to know, and the more you realize that you don't know. And for that reason, among others, I am very pleased that Jill has agreed to come to the Clark to share with us her thoughts on the topic through today's lecture, Nudity and Nakedness in Renaissance Europe. Please join me in welcoming Jill Burke. Hello, it's so wonderful to be here, and it's such a wonderful exhibition. I'm absolutely delighted to be a part of it. Um, I've been working on nudes now for far too long, several years, and I've just finished a book which hopefully will be coming out next year. Um, and I'm going to um, start with one painting and then kind of get wider and wider and, and, and a little bit deeper and then come back to it, and um, hopefully that'll be useful. And if any questions come up, um, it is uh, a subject full of questions, some of which are very difficult to answer and some of which have quite straightforward answers. So if there's any questions at the end, I'd be very glad to hear from you, though I can't promise to be able to answer them, um, but I'll do my best. Okay, so we're going to start by approaching a nude very carefully. 
We're going to go up and, and look at this nude, Susanna, um, Susanna and the Elders by Guaccino, which is, of course, in the exhibition downstairs. And we're going to look at what's happening. Sitting on a stone balcony and completely unaware of being watched. <coughs> Susanna gathers water from a fountain and directs it onto her lower leg. Here we go. You can just see, if you look closely at the painting downstairs, you can see the water. Intent on her bathing, her skin is soft, pale, hairless, almost luminous against a darkening sky. A lily is just visible uh, to the right of her stone seat. The flower, some of you may know, of the Virgin Mary, testifying to her purity. The mood is calm and introspective. However, this is a painting of two halves. Two men dominate the, le the left-hand side of the composition, their gnarled and veined hands, wrinkled faces, long unkempt beards, and rather grubby feet, uh, forming a really agitated contrast to the nude on the other side. One grasping a stick, which I think is rather phallic, I don't know if this is just me, but that seems to me, uh, gazes intently at the beautiful woman before him. His other hand forces itself into the viewer's space, his fingers outstretched, his muscles tense. His white-haired companion turns and looks at us, one hand flung back and the other with the index finger upwards in a gesture of admonition. What is he telling us with this gesture? Is he rather hypocritically upbraiding us for looking, or is he just telling us to be quiet so as not to disturb the scene? Now, a near contemporary account of this painting, Malvasia's Felsina Petrice, tells us that Guaccino executed it in 1617, early in his career, at the behest of a cardinal, uh, Alessandro Ludovisi, who was later to become Pope, Gregory XV. Now, it might seem strange and perhaps hypocritical, subject for a man of the church to commission. And in fact, the complexities of this painting and the kind of pulling and pushing of looking, desire, telling us off, bringing us in, is really typical of nude subjects of this period of the 17th century. Um, just to explain the story, uh, the story's from the Old Testament book of Daniel, um, when two community elders, so these men feverishly um, moving, harbor ungovernable desires for a colleague's wife, and they spy on her having a bath in the garden. And they're caught out by her. She notices them looking. And the elders threaten to say that they saw her in a dalliance with a young man if she doesn't sleep with them. So this terrible, dastardly uh, behavior. The virtuous woman refuses to accede to their demands. And they go ahead with their threats. And Susanna is sentenced to death. Um, now, everyone agrees she's about to, to, to be sentenced to death. And Daniel steps in in the nick of time and saves the day by questioning them about the tree that they saw her sleeping with the young man under. And one says it's an aspen and the other says it's an acacia. This is enough proof to save Susanna's life and have them executed. So, because they were lying, they're executed for false witness. So the moral of the story is that looking at beautiful naked women may be pleasantly stimulating, but it's not necessarily very good for you. Um, and this painting is telling us, as viewers, it's telling us off and demanding that we look at the same time. This complicated push-pull of sin and justification runs like a red thread through depictions of the female nude in the Renaissance and Baroque era. And you can see it in many paintings. And I'll just show a few in the exhibition. So here, this looks enormous on this screen. It's a much smaller painting, as you see downstairs. Um, here is the story of Diana and Actaeon. Um, Actaeon, the um, hunter, stumbles across Diana, her nymphs bathing in the forest. Here we see a nymph throwing water at Actaeon, which turns him into a stag, and he is devoured by his own hounds. Um, and this is um, a painting by Hendrik de Klerk and Dennis van Alsloot, just a little bit earlier than the Guachino. Again, in another painting of Diana and a nymph discovered by a, sat a satyr of uh, 1620s again, um, we see Diana sleeping um, with a nymph here, and the satyr comes in, points rudely to her, um, to the direction generally of her genitalia, and looks and, and um, with his tongue lolling out. And really, what Van Dyck is doing here was, is comparing us, comparing the viewer with the satyr, saying we're almost half man, half beast, to take advantage of ogling a beautiful, young, naked woman. These images are not just ambivalent in their approach to the female nude, but present the viewer with a choice. 
We can either follow the lead of the animalistic satyr, seeing in the female nude an opportunity to indulge in sinful sexuality, or we can follow a higher ground, appreciating the paintings for their aesthetic qualities and for the skill of the artist. And there's an idea that we'll look at later that to, have to appreciate, to take this higher ground, you have to be educated and you have to be of a certain social class, which is why these paintings were often closeted away um, where only a few select people could look at them. So given the difficulties of inherent in the presentation of the female nude here, why was the subject so popular? Between the fall of ancient Rome and the 15th century, there wasn't a significant artistic tradition of the nude uh, in, in Western art. There were nude figures, absolutely. There's a tradition of medieval nudes, but it wasn't so central to uh, artistic production. So what was it about Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries that made the nude such a coveted part of artistic tradition? And this is what we'll look at now. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I'm just showing you here uh, an ancient um, um, artwork. This is the Spinario, or the Thorn Puller. It's um, a Hellenistic sculpture. You can see it in Rome still today, and it's of a boy pulling a thorn out of his foot. Um, and I'm showing you it as an example of the kind of thing that um, Renaissance people were looking at um, when they um, thought about uh, classical art. And there's many, many copies of this from the Renaissance. And here I'm showing you three. This one is um, a drawing of a model taking the pose of the um, sculpture by Bernardo Gottsley, a Florentine artist. This is Marco de Ravenna. It's a print, again. Um, um, he says this is in, the, in, in Rome on the Capitol because it was publicly displayed on Capitol Hill. And this is a Swiss or German artist, again, with a kind of fantasy soldiers below uh, a pedestal. Um, so in the 15th century in Italy, there was a big revival of enthusiasm for antiquity and antique sculpture, particularly. Looking at classical art, Renaissance viewers were both impressed and puzzled by the display of so many beautiful naked bodies. Um, early on in the period, before uh, the, nude, uh, the, tradi the tradition for depicting nudes was revived, commentators just thought well, that non-Christians were allowed to depict the body in a way that Christians weren't. Um, so in 1426, the Florentine humanist Poggio Bracciolini claimed that the same license is not given to us Christians as was given to poets of old who did not know God. So really, it's just something that they couldn't do in the 15th century. It was rightly assumed that a different cultural and religious context meant that nakedness had a different significance in this earlier culture, that just what that significance was remained unclear. So you get debates in the Renaissance about why so many antique sculptures were naked. So the historian Raphael Maffei said that they liked nude statuary in classical times because the ancient Greeks liked to show off their art and because of their libidiousness. Um, but his contemporary, Piero Valeriano, said completely the opposite thing. He said antiquity was less vice-ridden than the present day. And so they could philosophize more plainly and frankly and about each and everything nor was there at that time anything in the human body that was considered disgraceful, either by sight or by name. So really they had no clue what was going on uh, in antiquity and why this was. Some, context, some commentators, like the artist Peter Paul Rubens, who we see many um, paintings um, by downstairs, regarded the, the fact that there were lots of antique nudes as due to the idea that people in antiquity had better bodies than people in, in present day times. He, he, thought, he thought that uh, really bodies had got much worse over time and that's why um, people didn't measure up. This is really, there's lots, lots, lots of ideas. Um, so out of this confusion, from around the 15th century, probably the mid 15th century, you start to see commentators create a framework in which drawing and painting the nude body is, a, is something that becomes important for artists to do. And the, the art theoretical framework first starts around the 1450s, and you first see it expressed by a humanist called Angela de Cembrio, um, writing about the Ferrarese court. And he says, Marquis Leonel d'Este explained that the best statues are either wholly or partly nude because the excellent works of the class, uh, those artists, classical artists, and of that time would be best judged in the state of nakedness. For it's not every fashion of clothing that pleases every subsequent generation and race, 
Some kinds of shoes and cloaks and belts and even armour becomes ridiculous, even in paintings. But the artifice of nature is supreme. No period fashions change it. So the idea was, if you saw people wearing old-fashioned clothes that looked really silly, then you couldn't really judge the painter. You'd be judging the clothing. But if people are naked, they always look more or less the same, so you can judge them against each other. And it, it makes sense, really, because if, if, you, if you think about, say, people wearing flares or something, it would be distracting um, if, 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 this, uh, if this was painted like this as opposed to a naked body. And this is taken on to such a huge extent in Italy that by the early 16th century, the ability to depict the nude becomes the test for art. So I'm showing you this painting by Lorenzo Costa. Um, this was painted for um, Isabella d'Este in Mantua. Um, and... Lorenzo Costa was deemed an artistic failure because of his inability to, draw the, to paint the nude. So Paolo Jovio in 1522 says no one, um, that no one can make dressed and armed figures more pleasantly than him. But if expert critics ask him as a greater test of his art to portray na naked figures, he is not able to do it easily because contenting himself with little preparation, he did not succeed in putting secure methods to the service of his painting. Now, this might not seem so bad to you, but I'll remind you, 1511 is the year before Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling was completed. So now he's, people are competing with people who specialise in depicting the nude, and depicting the nude in new and exciting ways. I don't know if anyone's seen the Sistine Chapel ceiling, I'll show you a slide of it uh, in a second, but it is an incredibly impressive and kind of uh, awe-inspiring sight. Now, by the time Lorenzo Costa was painting that painting in 1511, there'd been about 30 or 40 years of concentrated drawing after the nude figure in Florentine workshops. And this is a very Florentine technique. Um, these images I'm showing you here are all drawings from the workshops of Botticelli and Filippino Lippi from about the 1470s to about the 1490s. Um, People who were training to be artists started to draw systematically after the nude, and this was something that they did again and again. There are hundreds of these drawings surviving. Um, they, drawings don't survive generally, and the fact that there's so many indicates that there's something really, really new was going on. Um, they're all on prepared paper, so they're lots of different colours. They have this lovely jewel-like appearance when you put them together. And they all tend to be of men in various um, poses, so you can see the male nude uh, in action. Um, this practice spread throughout Europe. Um, in Italy, um, this, it was formalised in sessions known as Accademia del Naturale, um, and also it came to Northern Europe, um, at least by the end of the century. And here's a painting by Mikhail Switz, a drawing school, uh, where you can see just this happening. There's a, there's a nude model, and here's people drawing after him. Um, a similar academy for uh, studying for life was established in Harlem in Holland in the 1580s, and Switz himself op opened an academy for drawing from life in the 1650s. Now, if you look at these drawings, I'll show you both of them, you can see that a nude model, well, nearly nude, they generally did wear underwear, uh, would take up a var variety of poses. And here's two drawings from the, what I think is the Botticelli workshop, um, from um, probably about the 1480s or 90s. And you can see... These, uh, after the model taking the same poses, so this has a model with his hand on his hip. There it is, hand on his hip. Uh, model sitting down, model sitting down, if you turn uh, the paper around. Um, and here with his hand up and a, and, a, and a prop. Except this one is obviously much worse. It's quite a poor drawing as opposed to this person who's quite... Um, a quite good, quite accomplished artist. And so you can see people learning. If you, put the, if you look at a lot of these drawings, you can see these poses being taken up again and again um, in, in different ways. And like life drawing today, if anyone's done any life drawing today, you can get models of all shapes and sizes. And um, real emphasis is put on the artist, your own individual artistic interpretation of the model, and also um, representing you know, the moment of the pose and the, the um, bodily idiosyncrasies of the model. That's absolutely fine. That's not what they did in the Renaissance. They weren't interested in people looking different. But what they wanted is people with the best bodies possible. So they'd find a model 
Um, there's uh, often they'd, sal they'd salary a model or they'd find soldiers, people who were quite strong, and they'd ask them to pose for them. And um, they'd try and train the eye and the mind and the hand to create the most beautiful figure possible. Um, Leonardo da Vinci talks about this. He's the first person really to talk about the method, this method of life drawing. And this is about in the 1490s when he wrote this. He says, winter evenings ought to be used by youths for studying things arranged during the summer. So that is, take all the nudes you have done during the summer. So life drawing after, was done in the summer, obviously, because that's why it's too cold. So when it's warm enough to take your clothes off is when they do life drawing. Um, and reduce them together, making a selection of the best limbs and bodies from among these. Then put these into practice and well into your mind. So the idea is you remember what the best, what the most perfect limbs and what the most perfect poses look like. Then the following summer, choose someone in good condition physically, so someone good looking, um, and have that fellow make comely and gallant gestures. And if he does not show his muscles well within the contours of his limbs, this does not matter at all. Let it be sufficient for you to just get good poses from him and you can correct the limbs later using those that you studied during winter. So if your model had, say, weedy legs and a great torso, that's fine. You could find somebody else with better legs and put them together. The idea isn't to, to have an individual, but to create this kind of beautiful body. Um, this had a classical precedent in a story of an artist called Xerxes, who was, had to paint a picture of Helen of Troy, who was the most beautiful woman in the world. And to do that, he combined lots of different models and combined the best of each model to make the most beautiful woman, a, be a woman more beautiful than one that actually existed on Earth. And that's the whole idea of Renaissance life drawing. Eventually, the idea was that the artist would be able to create a perfected nude without even needing to look at a model. It would all be from his head. And so then, therefore, it would be independent of the imperfections of all bodies. Um, um, and then with that perfect me uh, nude, he would be able to evoke various mental states, various stories through posing the body. And, oh, sorry, I, I should have said that some artists went a bit far with this collation. This is a, a, paint, a drawing that you might recognize. It's Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. And, and Leonardo did this by measuring and this is what's happening in this drawing. He's measuring um, parts, of the, parts of the body and collating them with measurement to make it the perfect figure. And so this is how Leonardo Vitruvian Man. And this is completely imagined. It's an imagined body. It's not, and it's not from life. Okay. So you get this perfect body. And then you understand, you look at how to put forward to bring across different kinds of states of mind through bodily actions. And this was the thing that was really, really praised. And here's the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And you see it in the, the nudes, the many, many nudes in the Sistine Chapel ceiling, all of whom are posing in various different ways, using their bodies in, in very expressive ways. And Michelangelo, once he, the Sistine Chapel ceiling was unveiled in 1512, really everything started to change very quickly. Um, there was prints after Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling and after his earlier work, and they spread throughout Europe, and the, the nude became a new thing that people had to, had to emulate and had to be able to do. And you can see this here. So this is, um, two of these are in the exhibition. Uh, Francesco de Zerberan, Labours of Hercules, was doing the same kind of thing. And you can almost imagine these coming from those Florentine life drawing sessions. You can see this tradition of looking at, them, looking at the male nude that started in Florence in the 1470s, going right through uh, to Spain in the 17th century. And this is something that, that was copied and emulated all over Europe and became a test of artistry. Right. You might be quietly wondering where the female nude has gone. Um, I haven't talked about female nudes at all. Now, in Italy, in the 15th century, the female nude did not figure in the conversations about the perfect body. The early 15th century painter Cianino Cianini explains that I will leave out women, he says, in his discussion of drawing, I will leave out women because they don't have perfect proportions. He says, basically, don't even bother measuring them. They're just, their bodies are rubbish compared to men's. Um, because of medical, a lot of medical beliefs at the time, and the, there's a belief in the humoral system, there's a sense that women's bodies were simply imperfect versions of a male body. 
I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think that. Um, I'm just relaying this. Um, um, there's a sense that in the womb that, that, that babies became female because there was not enough heat generated in the womb to make them to become male. So necessarily, the perfect body was therefore male. So you get this concentration on the male nude in these circles in Italy in the 15th and early 16th centuries. Now, it's perhaps a no surprise that some artists and spectators thought the most beautiful female bodies were ones that looked male. And Michelangelo's approach to the nude is just a logical extension of putting together all these most beautiful bits of people and collating them. So you'll see Michelangelo's female figures do look mask do, do to us look masculine, but at the time there was a, a real fashion for um, putting together, collating male and female characteristics. And this was thought to be very beautiful, not in a kind of way that you might look at a beautiful real person, but a very artistic, very studied uh, uh, beauty. Um, and I have to say, Michelangelo did use female models. This is often something that people say, but he did have female models, but he chose to use male models. Uh, and chose to make his, his, his female figures uh, masculine. This is a beautiful drawing that's in the Metropolitan uh, Museum in New York. Um, clearly after, I think we can agree, a male model. And this is his Libyan Sybil. That's a drawing, a drawing of who's collated these qualities to make uh, a female uh, figure out of a male model. People in the Renaissance also thought that Michelangelo was maybe lacking something. They also thought, hmm, I'm not sure about this, some of them. So in the 1550s, Pier Piero Liguria complained. He said, some painters, clearly Michelangelo, make women with emotions and appearances that seem far removed from feminine delicacy, with harsh muscles and breasts like citrons, so muscular and strangely put together. Around the same time, another critic, Ludovico Dolce, complained that Michelangelo does not recognize or else is unwilling to take into account the distinctions between ages and sexes. The man who sees one figure by Michelangelo has seen them all. Uh, so, and, and this, honestly, these kind of comments I'm still getting in classes um, and, uh, from, from students, it's, it's, there is a lack of variety. And this is a necessary, uh, necessary corollary to this method of making the nude figure, this kind of collecting everything together to make one ideal type of figure. So it doesn't really, this academic nude, as I've called it, doesn't necessarily encompass the variety of human bodies that was also demanded by patrons. And it also, depending on your, your point of view, but doesn't necessarily deal with a female nude very well, doesn't necessarily make kind of sensuous female nudes that also um, were in demand. And by the 1510s, alternative approaches to the female nude model had started to gain, gain traction, particularly in the Republic of Venice. The story of, this is um, uh, Apelles paints, this is Apelles, and this is Campaspe. The story of the great Greek painter Apelles, Emperor Alexander the Great, and his beautiful courtesan Campaspe, was most famously told by Pliny the Elder in his natural history, the classical writer Pliny the Elder, and illustrated in the Renaissance by several Italian and Northern artists. And this is um, Hulz van Winger. Um, what happened is Alexander, who's not on this painting, asked Apelles to paint Campaspe, um, paint Campaspe's portrait. He asked her, because she was such a beautiful, famously beautiful courtesan, Alexander asked Apelles, who was the most famous artist at the time, to paint her portrait. And the Apelles did so, and he created an image of such beauty that Alexander fell in love with the portrait and gave uh, Apelles Campaspe as a present. So Campaspe the courtesan is not as good as the portrait that Apelles painted. Now this is a story that a lot of Renaissance artists knew um, and Campaspe also then served as a model for a lot of famous paintings such as Venus Rising from the Sea which became really important um, subject for artists from Botticelli onwards. The other highly famous maker of female nudes from classical times was Praxiteles sculptor of the Canadian Venus, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, um, this pose, the Venus Pudica pose, um, before. Um, this image was frequently copied, admired, and even feared for its beauty and sexual allure. In the Renaissance, this sculpture was known through various copies, amongst the most famous of which was the Venus de' Medici, which is this one here. Pliny and other sources explain that the model for Praxiteles Venus was a beautiful courtesan, Phryn, whose allure was such that she succeeded in winning a hopeless court case simply by bearing her chest 
It's a great story. She just kind of exposed her chest and everyone said, yeah, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, these stories were circulating widely in Italy from the beginning of the 15th century, uh, from the, sorry, the latter half of the 15th century, when Pliny was published and translated into Italian. And you can see the echoing of the Canadian Venus, of this pose of Venus Pudica, in many, many images of the time. The more you look, the more you'll find. And there's just uh, three here, 1425, 1519, and the 1630s. It goes right through. Um, these two images particularly draw on this idea of the artist painting a beloved and desirous woman. That this woman is so beautiful, the artist wants to record her, but by recording her, um, her features, he's also making them better, making them um, eternal and kind of protecting them from aging. And you can see the process of, um, instead of putting together many female models, what, what you do with Female news is you tend to start with one very beautiful woman, one woman who's known. And this is also part of courtesan culture, which I don't have much time to talk about. But if you want to ask me about it, I'll talk, oh, we can talk about it. Um, so, and you can see this in, in Titian's work particularly. Okay, so one of these is downstairs. Um, this is um, his Venus and, with an organ, organist and Cupid. And there's five of these paintings which show Venus with a musician. And the first one looks to most commentators, like it's basically a double portrait. This um, figure has been um, recognized as Francesco Assonica, and this figure is thought to be a courtesan, a Venetian courtesan of this time. And what you see is a process of idealization when you start with a kind of recognizable face of a model and maybe maintain her beautiful body, but change it with a very idealized face. You can see these faces look almost too good, too idealized to be true. This is really typical. You see this going through a lot of Titian's work. And in fact, he was criticized for this very tendency. And this is a little um, passage from uh, the sculptor Vincenzo Dante. He wrote a treatise on perfect proportion in 1567. And he said, Titian, and like Michelangelo, who he was a big fan of, sometimes depicts the most beautiful female figure and sometimes not so beautiful, depending on the model, depending on whether he has many beautiful bodies to portray. And he says he doesn't really paint nudes, he just portrays them. He paints portraits of nudes, and this is a, a bad thing for Vincenzo Dante. It's no accident that this is the approach taken to the female nude, when the line between the portrait, a portrait of a beautiful individual woman, and an idealized generic beauty is sometimes really hard to tell. So I'll show you again, this is downstairs, a um, Tintoretto portrait of a woman bearing her breast, and this is Titian's Flora. They think this is, is probably of a real existing person, the courtesan of Veronica Franco, and we think this is probably just an idealized figure from Titian's head. But it's really difficult, actually, with many of these images painted at this time to tell whether they're portraits of women or not. Beauty conventions were incredibly narrow in the Renaissance. And in the 16th century, they were repeated endlessly. It's real, there's a real tightening up of ideas about how women should look, what beauty consists of in the um, early 16th century. So women should have golden hair, teeth like pearls, skin like ivory tinged with pink roses, breasts like apples. You get, you, they just list these, um, these, these qualities. Um, in my current research project, I'm looking at how women actually tried using cosmetics and um, other um, dieting, things like this, to, to, to make themselves into this ideal, um, um, ideal form. Um, but it's not surprising that it's very, the line between portraiture and I, I, idealized faces is very, very narrow indeed in the Renaissance. Um, another difference between the male and female nude lay in different attitudes to the naked female body. Male nakedness was something that was encountered, generally with genital covering, with some kind of underwear, um, but it was something that was encountered in the Renaissance city. Some professions, such as dyers, would be working in vats of urine for a lot of the day, and they didn't want to get their clothes dirty, so they'd work largely naked. Fishermen would work naked. Men would go swimming um, uh, half naked. Poor men often had, were barely covered, and so male nakedness was something that was more familiar and um, was less shameful. Female nakedness was overwhelmingly a marker of sexual shame. Um, in fact, women's nudity was believed to be profoundly dangerous, both for the woman and, most importantly, in, in this period, for the onlook of the male onlooker. 
So the Spanish scholar Juan Luis Vive, in his hugely influential Education of a Christian Woman, first published in 1524, claimed that the more wanton, the more wanton men that is, seeing a part of the body not usually exposed to view are inflamed as if they had caught fire. No part of the female body, vile and useless servant, should be seen. And he talked about veiling, having gloves, everything, and, and, and women did go uh, veiled, um, at least older women much of the time. A hundred years later, the Dutch poet and jurist Jacob Katz claimed in his treatise on marriage of 1625 that women should keep their limbs concealed at all times. It's not possible to fully express by language, he says, how far, how far the fire of lust will shoot, shoot through all limbs when a loose youth just sees a naked bosom. Um, so um, this is very scary stuff, these women. Now, this fear that was undoubtedly true of the naked female body, this association of the naked female body with shame, has led some art historians to doubt the existence of any female life models at all during this period. Um, and it's a bit of a bugbear of mine because they definitely, definitely existed. Um, this is a Raphael work. If you look at the Raphael workshop, 1519, 1520, there's loads of drawings that are clearly after a female model. Sometimes, as if in this wonderful um, pen and ink drawing by Vincenzo Tamagni, who's a member of the Raphael workshop, clearly a female model in motion. Um, so female models did exist. Um, however, it could be really hard getting women to pose naked for you sometimes. Um, and there's even in, in, in relatively liberal times and places like Venice in the 16th century. So Ludovico Domenici was writing a treatise on the nobility of women in 1549, and he explained, if I had a beautiful and graceful woman in my house, I'd do almost anything else than allow her to be the prey of an insolent and saucy artist, most likely young and lusty. God knows if she would return intact and unviolated. The mid-16th century sculptor Benvenuto Cellini's account of his models would suggest that these fears were founded. One, he got pregnant, and the other gave him syphilis. So there is this sense that models standing naked before a man was really quite transgressive. But that doesn't mean that people didn't do it. And there, there are payments for, male and female mod for, for female models um, in, in the historical record. These moral concerns were intensified during the period of Catholic reform later in the 16th and early 17th centuries. The Academia di San Luca, the Painters' Academy in Rome, banned the use of female nude life models in 1607, again an indication that, they exist, that these sessions existed, but they were banned in 1607. Letters by the Florentine painter Francesco Farini, and here is Farini's uh, wonderful lot and his daughters, which is downstairs. Um, he wrote letters in the 1640s when he was living in Rome, offers a bit of some insights into the challenges artists um, faced. Farini expresses his exasperation with Roman women. He says, these women live with such freedom that it's shameful. For my honest and honorable purposes, they all become Lucretias. In the end, the ones who are suitable don't want to strip, and those who will strip would make a good model for witches. He sends, yeah, I know, it's awful. He sends for, he, he has two sisters in Florence who he pays to model for him. So he thinks, oh, I'll just send for the Florentine models. And then he finds out that they're both pregnant. Um, and so he says, oh, I'll just use the Venus de Medici. I can't be bothered with these women anymore. Um, according to his biographer, Filippo Baldinucci, Farini's need for female models led to intolerable expense. And so he never made any money from his paintings. Oh, I've got a nice, a lovely life drawing by uh, Farini here presumably of one of these Florentine sisters. Um, and, it's, and you see higher, in Lorenzo Lotta's account books of the early, mid 15th, 16th century Florin, uh, Venetian artist, you see higher payments for women um, to model than for men. If it was hard to get a female life model in Italy, the moral climate in the Protestant North made it even harder. Prostitution was made completely illegal in some Dutch and German cities in the 16th century. And reports of female life models in the Netherlands tend to come from criminal trials. Um, so they happen, they, they are life models, but they're frowned upon. And this is um, a drawing, a copy of um, Rembrandt and his pupils drawing from a, a female nude model here. Um, so in 1658, a certain Maria Lamotte was arrested for prostitution, and one of the um, accusations um, set against her is that she posed publicly at the Assembly of Painters in Harlem and that she was the usual model for the painter Dirk Blaker. 
in the same year, a woman from Amsterdam named Katarina Jans reportedly sat stark naked uh, before Rembrandt's pupils and other colleagues as a model, and they, the witnesses, drew and painted her. Another Harlem painter, Johannes Terentius, gave testimony in 1627 that he sought prostitutes to model for him. He would go to a brothel in The Hague to see if there were persons of the female sex, beautiful of body and limb, who might be willing to show some of their naked parts with the purpose of being drawn so that those later could be used in paintings. You get the, 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 the sense that these artists are desperately trying to get women to strip naked in front of them, and women are just saying, no, we're not interested. Um, this attitude in the North was a problem for when they looked at Italian art of the early 16th century because they were thinking, who are all these naked women who, say, Titian would, would paint? Um, and it might have been unpleasant for them to think that these beautiful nudes could have been morally suspect courtesans. So this led to a bit of creative rewriting of, of art history. This is Titian's portrait of a woman bearing her breast in Apsley House in London, uh, not often called Titian's mistress. This is what this, uh, this painting is, uh, is, is called uh, informally. And this is uh, Lucas Forsterman's print after this painting, uh, which is also painted by Rubens. Um, and on the bottom of this print, it says, Behold, she who was pleasing to her husband, she bears chaste ple ple uh, pledges of marriage in her belly. So this idea that it's Titian's wife. Of course, it's Titian's wife that he paints, so that's okay. Um, and this is an, a telling assertion, because Rubens is one of the few artists who undoubtedly used his wife as a model. Um, there are very few reports of Italian painters using their wives. Um, it's, it's incredibly rare, but it does happen sometimes. Rubens married the 16-year-old Hélène Formont, there she is, in 1630, in order, he said, to enjoy licit pleasure with thankfulness. And we know that Formont served as a model for this painting, the little fur, Het Pelskin, um, when she was around 24 in 1638 a painting that was kept in her possession during her lifetime, probably because of its explicit eroticism. It may have been less problematic to present Formant in the guise of a mythological figure, in this case a goddess, here. A 1639 letter from Cardinal Infante Ferdinand of Austria to his brother, King Philip IV of Spain, explains that the Venus in Rubens' Judgment of Paris is a portrait of Formant, of Helen Formant, who, he says, is without doubt the most beautiful woman to be found here. Only one life drawing by Rubens survives. It's unquestionably after a female model. And it's, again, recognisably of Helen Formant. It's also possible, I think, and maybe this is extrapolating too much, to set uh, the painting of Hetz Pelskin against the Fortuna and see, it, and see that Titian's technique of abstracting from a portrait of a beautiful woman, abstracting it to make it... Uh, a kind of um, almost a, a timeless mythological figure was possibly here, because I do think there's elements between these two paintings, between the faces of these two women that, that, that are certainly shared. Although sensuous images decidedly had uses that many might consider immoral, such artworks were also widely seen to play a decent role in the context of married life. The earliest images of nudes in Italy were connected with the adornment of the marital chamber. There are several extant cassoni or chests, marriage chests um, from the mid-15th century that have nudes on the underside of the lid. So you'd open the lids and there you'd have a nude come and see, uh, pop out when you were getting your linen or whatever out. And these are two that survive, there are very few surviving examples of this, but these two survive. There are a pair of chests in the um, Museum for Art in Copenhagen. And there's a woman here and a man who has his underwear on, uh, so he's more respectable uh, in, in this one. Um, Painted Cassoni would fall out of fashion by the end of the 15th century, but the practice of depicting nudes from the marital chamber would continue, and this is where you get really famous nude images like Giorgione's uh, and Titian's um, um, reclining uh, Sleeping Venus, um, which was made for the Venetian patrician Girolamo, Girolamo Marcello around 1510, and it was pl pl placed in his marriage chamber. chamber. It's associated with his marriage. Looking at images of beautiful people was thought to aid in the conception of healthy offspring. Um, so in his treatise, Considerazione sulla Pittura, Thoughts on Painting of 1617 to 21, the physician Giulio Mancini explained that lascivious pictures are appropriate for the room where one has to do with one's spouse, because once seen, they serve to arouse one and to make healthy, beautiful, and charming children. 
but they must nevertheless not be seen by children and old maids, nor by strangers and fastidious persons. And inventory records from merchant homes in Italy suggest that bed bedchambers were the usual place for nude. So you can see this, this kind of connection is clear. Um, though the, there was lots of naked figures as the 16th century goes on, also on things like plates, historiated um, maiolica, you know, decorated plates and things like that, used for wedding services. Nudes seem to have been used for similar purposes in the, in the Netherlands as well. So you, in the in inventories from 17th century Antwerp, suggest that paintings of female nudes, just like this one, it's a reclining Venus with Cupid here, uh, were often displayed on chimney breasts. Uh, as um, here, the representation of Venus, the goddess of love, is again to do with marriage and intended to wish the couple a long and, and happy life together. Throughout Europe during this period, there's clearly a context where the depiction of nudes was okay. Uh, and this was largely connected with marital love and procreation. The other way of enjoying the nudes was to appreciate the artist for his skill, as opposed to being physically drawn to the subject matter. And this is rather complicated, really hard balancing act, and could only be attempted by people who are highly educated in the visual arts and of high moral standing. So this is why the Sala Reservada, the, the closed rooms, start to start for the aristocracy, because they are able to look at these paintings in the proper way, not in an unpleasantly sexual way. Printed nudes were censored, and this starts quite startlingly in the 1520s. Um, this is all we have left of the, um, and it's not even the original, this is a copy of the original series of um, some scurrilous uh, erotic prints by Marc Antonio Raimondi called I Modi um, that, um, that were made in Rome in the 1520s. Drawings of sexual encounters between couples had been circulating in the papal court for many, many years, but, and they, that was absolutely fine, no one had any problems with that, but when they were printed and this had a wider circulation there was a huge outcry and the, and the Pope called back all the, all the prints, the prints were destroyed, the plates were destroyed and Marc Antonio Raimondi was imprisoned because it wasn't thought suitable for the common people who weren't cardinals, who weren't dukes, who weren't educated, it wasn't thought suitable for everyone to, to have access to this kind of material. As the 16th century wore on, churchmen throughout Europe vied with each other for ever louder condemnations of explicit painting. So you have Johannes Milanus, who's Philip II's uh, censor in the Netherlands in 1470, forbidding the making in any way of pictures which offend the eyes, corrupt the mind, and kindle base pleasures. Jacob Ka Jacob Katz, again in, the mar in his marriage, emphasised the dangerous titillation of the viewer caused by the female nude. Interestingly, the better the picture, the more likely the peril. His compatriot, Raphael Camp Campoisen, railed against painters who present men and women stark naked. The viewing of beautiful figures, he said, makes the mind drunk and causes men to lose their senses. Despite, or perhaps because of the fact that its aristocrat aristocratic paintings patrons owned the most co important collection of erotic paintings in Europe, the most intense opposition to nudes and paintings occurred in Spain really more, this is, it's very interesting coming from an Italian perspective where there's much more laissez-faire attitude in Spain. There's a huge clamp down on nudes. Um, Juan de Boutron's defensive painting, Ap Ap Apologetic Discourses, published in Madrid in 1626, says that paintings of nudes make the onlooker a slave to lust. Likewise, in his dialogues of painting of 1633, the court painter Vicente Caduco says artists should prevent mortal sin by not painting those dishonest and lascivious things that were in the invention of the devil. This injunction was given a legal standing in the 1640 Index of Prohibited and Expurgated Books, which forbade the, important, in the, the importation of lascivious paintings into Spain. Their display in public squares, streets, and common areas of the home, and also on the threat of excommunication, prohibited the painting or sculpting of new works of this type. So this is 1640 in Spain, new to basically outlawed completely. The most stringent opposition to erotic images came from the preacher Hortensio Felix Paravicino. There's a wonderful portrait of him by El Greco in Boston that I just saw. Um, he was a great collector of, painter, uh, paint, of paintings and a friend to painters, but he nevertheless believed, perhaps because of this, that the ownership of paintings of the nude should be outlawed because of their power. He wrote in 1669, the finest paintings are the greatest threat, burn the best of them. 
Paintings that depicted the female nude successfully were necessarily dangerous to the viewer. So by the time the young Guachino picked up his brush to paint Susanna and the elders for his cardinal patron, there had been 200 years of theorizing about and worrying over the artistic nude, essential to show off artistic skill, yet luring the viewer into sinfulness, desired but abhorred, hidden and revealed, the complexities of looking at the naked body is part of the subject's allure. The Renaissance nude explored these ideas in an unprecedented way and sparked off a debate that still exists in our magazines, in our movies and on our computer screens today. Thank you. When you brought up uh, Los Spinario and the fascination with antique sculpture, were they aware of a distinction between classical and Hellenistic sculpture at all? Okay. They didn't. They they really didn't know about things. Uh, you know, Roman coffins. So the naturalism of Hellenism. They 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 they, yeah. they started to try and make distinctions between different periods, but it was really. They, they, it was yeah. such an embassy. It's really the 18th century where you get these distinctions properly sure. made. So they didn't have much of a clue. They just admired them hugely and okay. copied after them. But in terms of, they were, they were kind of starting to work out whether things were copies or not. But really, it was in, in its infancy, this kind of study. So no, they didn't. Okay. And the other thing is, um, I was just wondering why um, you omitted Kronach and uh, the German Renaissance uh, and their nudes. Um, I. Absolutely, I'm totally fascinated by the, the German. They, they approach the nude figure in a different way. Uh, their female nudes are actually really, really more advanced than Italian female nudes in the 15th century yeah. from the Van Eyck tradition. Um, so um, they, like many things with the Northern Renaissance, until you get to Jura, there's less theory. And Jura comes in and theorizes everything, you know, because he's been to Italy and is interested in this kind of thing. Um, I'm actually working on something to do with the, those nudes in the uh -huh. 1520s uh -huh. now. So I can't really say, I, I'm, all I can say now is that I'm very <coughs> interested in them. Mm -hmm. And there's clearly a tradition there that really hasn't been written into the history of the nude yet. And that would be, it's very good to look at. They're great. I see. Well, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Lecture. Can I follow up on that? Mm -hmm. um, kind of aside from the Western ones, the famous nude woman was Eve. Yeah. And I'm just curious as to why we didn't see more eaves in your presentation. I haven't seen the exhibit downstairs yet. Well, the present there isn't, there's not an eve downstairs. It's, uh, no, I'm not, <laughs> no that, that's, that's, I mean, really, because I, I wanted to use some of the paintings downstairs, and I thought that would be the nicest way to do it. Eve, well, there's a huge, I mean, Eve is one of the earliest female nudes to be portrayed in any, um, uh, in any systematic way. Eve, actually, both Adam and Eve get increasingly naked as the Renaissance goes on. In the biblical story, they discover they're naked and they cover her up instantly. And you see this in medieval, the medieval tradition. You'll see the um, pre-fall, Adam and Eve naked, and they stand there, and that's quite normal. And you, but then, um, after they realise that they're naked, they start to cover themselves up, either with leaves or with uh, furs. You see a lot in medieval painting. What happens in the 15th and 16th centuries is that they start to not wear any clothes ever, even when they really should be ashamed of themselves. They make, cover themselves, but they're increasingly naked. So the story of Adam and Eve is really, really interesting in terms of how, what it reveals about attitudes to nakedness and shame. And Eve, the, I only showed you one, which was the Masaccio Eve, um, that's clearly, for his Eve, is a gesture really of shame, whereas this becomes a gesture almost of titillation, covering, and uncovering as the century goes by. So, um, so Eve and the, story, and, and the idea of Eve being the temptress is really fundamental for the way that people understand women and understand naked women. But I just didn't talk about it because it just didn't fit in with the exhibition. But it, it will feature in my book. <laughs> you know. so. 
I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the salas reservadas. Um, especially, uh, I, I have this, of course, one would want to, to read your book. I don't know if you talk about them in your book. Okay, <laughs> so maybe that would uh, help me to understand. In, in what way some of the paintings that we admire now uh, would be just the works of art, and in what way would they be against the laws or uh, uh, moral um, uh, code of the society? And also, who, uh, who were the uh, owners afraid of the most? Was it the church? And if so, uh, some of the cardinals were also the owners of some of the paintings they, that would be in their salas reservadas. So uh, I am quite unclear, you know, in what way it was like porno pornography. Um, so thank you for... I can say there is an excellent essay, not by me, in the catalogue about, about the display of nudes in the Sala Reservada. So if you want to know more about that, you should have a look at the catalogue. It's really wonderful. Um, I, the re this is complicated. And it was, if you, if you look, say, at Philip II and Titian, Philip II commissioned um, a series of mythological paintings um, by Titian that um, there's a copy downstairs of one of them by Rubens. Um, and these paintings were most likely kept behind curtains and kept in a part of um, the palace which was only accessible by a certain chosen set of people. Okay, so, so they're, almost, they're almost protected um, and looked at um, in special occasions when you're kind of prepared for it. And there is a sense that in all the discussions about... Um, about the nude, there's a sense that people need to be protected. People who are not educated, women, particularly the young, need to be protected from this it's dangerous aspect. So the idea is that if you are educated and above reproach, like a king or a cardinal, you'll be okay. Obviously, this is deeply problematic and thought to be deeply problematic at the time as well and it was people argue I think that sometimes when we look at the past, at past societies we think oh it's all they had there's an answer here that's clear it, they, it, with the nude nothing is clear everything is contested and at some periods and places things are more acceptable but often people were viciously talking about cardinals pretending that it's all about classical mythology when really we know it's not about classical mythology um, so these ideas that we have of like uh, uh, that, that there's a hypocrisy there was absolutely also understood in the renaissance so in, in some ways that question is not an answerable question um, because uh, they were kept to one side. Spain's a very particular um, culture um, where nudes were really kept away from the eyes of the public. It's very much, much, much more so than Italy or um, uh, even Northern Europe. I think Italy is probably the most liberal place, but um, Spain was really, really particular, and that's why this collection from the Prado is so extraordinary because it is so such an important collection and so broad in range but it was hidden um and and uh, for, for, se for several years but yes that's that's hope that helps thanks for a wonderful talk I have a question so some paintings, we have three examples downstairs of paintings of St. Sebastian. Ah, yeah, okay. So my question is, so here are paintings that are made in a religious context and mostly for religious spaces. Mm -hmm. And St. Sebastian was a very popular topic. You see it over and over. And usually, as the, with the ones downstairs, he's almost completely naked. Mm -hmm. Now, he was a Roman soldier, and presumably you often see his armor cast around on the ground around him. So here, so just so this this is another kind of very complicated issue of uh, nearly nude man being being painted for a religious context. And can you just talk about that for a second? 
Well, I mean, it's really interesting, and again, this is something I couldn't fit into the talk, but the, the most important nude, the early nude, is Christ, actually. Uh, he was presented almost naked and gets increasingly, shows more and more of his body from the, about the 14th century onwards, so before all this, uh, all this kind of study of the nude starts. Um, and St. Sebastian is another saint who's presented nearly naked, and this is to do with the change in a kind of emphasis on empathy in Christianity, where people start to... Um, there's various writings that, that talk about um, being like Christ and feeling the pain of Christ. St. Sebastian, importantly, is a plague saint. So he's a saint that people would pray to um, when uh, there was dangers of the plague. You can't emphasise how terrifying the plague was. Uh, there were waves of plague throughout Europe. Uh, from the 1340s onwards, uh, right through our period, and they would the plague could um, you could catch the plague at eight o'clock in the morning and you'd be dead at six o'clock at night. It acted very very quickly, and it seeming seemingly was you know could, was completely arbitrary. So having a saint who's who had a whole body after being you know pierced by arrows is a way that people could identify with this figure and pray to him. And St. Sebastian, that's one of the reason that St. Sebastian is so popular is because he delivered people. People felt that they delivered him and their loved ones from the plague. Um, so that's a whole different thread, really, really important thread of news. And of course, it also comes into this um, artistic tradition. And the way that you curated the show so wonderfully was you could see all these differences in poses as you go into that room, um, which also links to this tradition of, of paintings. So it's a little bit of both, but certainly this religious concentration on the body and the kind of wholeness of the body is also very important in, in religious portrayals of the male nude. Yeah. Was there any sort of So can you say that? I didn't hear the beginning of that. Okay, I'm just wondering if there was any accompanying movement in portraying good women, virtuous, ah. virtuous women, that they brought up to sort of uh, contest this influence of the wicked uh, women. Well, the, I mean, the Virgin Mary, it, it, we, we look at the Renaissance, you might think of nude figures. In fact, most Renaissance images are religious. Uh, most images from Southern Europe at this time are of the Virgin Mary and of saints. And these, if you look at inventories of homes, um, I'm talking about bef before um, in Southern Europe, uh, the Virgin and Child, Virgin and Child, Virgin and Child, Virgin and Child, there's hundreds of them. And um, these were churned out by artist workshops. So this was a normal image, if you, the normal image of women that women would see were was of the Virgin Mary um, and saints and this kind of thing. So absolutely, um, these nudes were more of a kind of... Uh, there are, there, are, there are images of nudes as prints and things that would, would have been owned. Um, but this, they, were, they weren't, I, as far as I understand it, just churned out for interior decoration in quite the same way as religious works were. So your general person, you know, your woodworker or something would... Yeah, and they, they tend to, tended to be confined to the bedchamber, whereas you'd get images of the Virgin Mary. Most, in an awful lot of most rooms would have an image of a Virgin Saint somewhere. Yeah. portraying nudes, uh -huh. but I was wondering um, if you could simplify why did Rubens paint so many naked women? And they were, you know, this was, this was, uh, was it, I know, I understand that he was a, a, a shrewd businessman, not uh -huh. only a very, a very, you know, fantastic painter, but uh, is there a simple answer to why Rubens they and, were very and nudes go together so well? Ruben, Rubens and nudes do go together extremely well. Um, he was, he was um, most of them were commissioned. Uh, they were very popular for aristocratic patrons. They showed a kind of refined sensibility. They were very fashionable. Sorry, this is, lots, this is not a simple answer. There's lots of uh, different answers. But I think this is really why. And he became known for his depiction of a very specific... Rubens' nudes are not like any other nudes. They admired his... Uh, one thing that was really admired in Rubens is his ability to depict skin so well. 
Um, you know, to portray different types of skin, rippling skin on, on a female nude in a way that really, if you look at the kind of marble-like sheen of Italians who were painting at the time, people like Farini, then look at Rubens, it's, or, or, or indeed this Guercino nude, it's not like a Rubens nude at all, is it? Rubens was really celebrated for his ability to depict the kind of softness of skin, and the female nude was a vehicle for this, but also patrons loved female nudes as well. These aristocratic patrons wanted them, and so he did really churn out an awful, an awful lot, not, churn out is the wrong word, paint an awful lot of these nudes. Um, and, and I think that's, that's probably why people wanted them. And he really loved his wives and painted after them as well, so. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you <laughs> thank so you much. Okay, thank you. <laughs>